was to make a recommendation as to what ought to be done. So that was my brief. I've since delivered on that brief and I see that there is a lot of debate that was engendered by President Mbeki raising an issue about whether or not there was political interference. Now, in the report, one of the remarks or one of the recommendations I make is that precisely because I was assisted initially by two junior advocates and by the time we wrote the report there was one junior advocate who was assisting me and that was all we had and we were limited in terms of time within which we must produce the opinion to three months I did not have the wherewithal, the tools, to do a thorough investigation of whether there was interference, political interference, the extent of that interference in the work of the NPA. But enough was given to me for me to be able to come to a conclusion that there was sufficient that was put before me to raise the issue. Vusi Pikoli and some other people in the National Prosecuting Authority, civil society organizations like the Foundation for Human Rights, made representations and it became clear to me that in order to deal with this issue properly a commission of inquiry shall have to be established which will focus on seeking to answer this very same question, this question that is was there or was there no political interference in the work of the national prosecuting authorities? Because there have been people who have said we were interfered with Vus himself and as you know there has been now this reaction by President Mbeki. And I say it is all the more the reason that my recommendation must be supported by civil society organizations who must put pressure on the current government to create that mechanism. Now, that commission, I know South Africans are commission fatigued. Marikana commission, this commission, this, and they ask the question, but what have these has achieved? But at least if this commission has the power of search and seizure. It can subpoena witnesses in its terms of references. Then everybody will be given an opportunity, including those like, for instance, you know, uh, Minister Mabanda, who was minister at the time, and against whom there are allegations that she said to the NPA, listen, yeah, you Ackerman, Advocate Ackerman, Advocate Vusipikoli, stay away from these TRC related cases. Now I know that because that has been the evidence in the Zondo Commission, that has been what was put before me. But now we know that President Mbeki has taken not only an exception to to what my findings were, but it does appear that he is contesting the veracity 
of the position that influenced my uh, recommendation. So what is the best way to deal with it? Let there be a commission of inquiry. Let him go there. Let him subject himself to cross-examination, even if it is limited cross-examination, like we did, for instance, in the Marikana Commission. And even though people say, well, what came out of it? But there was you know, an opportunity for people to say under oath what they did or did not do, and there was an opportunity for them to be cross-examined on what they say they did and did not do. So that's where we are at. Um, there was a question about the land question. Uh, childhood development hunger. I, I, I now I've forgotten what the question was by Rex Mulefe. Again. Yes, I just put a um, childhood development hunger, the poor not having anything to eat. Uh, but I forgot the question. Was it your question? Uh, uh, you know, charters. That was the point. Because I believe that violence in itself is so violent. And I was arguing that if these deepening inequalities and poverty are not contained, the situation might spiral out of control and trigger what we call sporadic revolution. And the, the consequences will be dire. So that was what I was submitting. And then the, on the issue of the land, I was saying there is that demand, there is an increased cry for her uh, land, and also that need to be uh, resolved. Uh, that's what I was submitting. Uh, thank you. Well, <laughs> I, d I don't think there's a question really there that I can, I can answer to. I can only say, you know, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, like I was saying in my, in my address, you know, we, South Africa is not without ideas, or the South African civilian population is not without ideas as to, as to what is going on. I mean, I don't really have even to picture or say anything about the current conditions. I mean, there's hunger everywhere. There's decay everywhere. There are potholes all over the place. And there's a way in which one says, things have never been like this before. There are claims of corruption everywhere. Everyone who is in, you know, um, in municipalities, in all, you know, uh, tires of government, all of them are having to uh, face, you know, um, people clamoring for service delivery, which is not taking place. And, uh, and like I said, South Africa has never been in a position in which it is as it is today. And if anything, an analysis by anyone of the last 30 years of South African democracy, I don't think anyone is brave to say we are better today than when we were at the beginning of our democracy. And no one has got a ready answer. 
I don't profess to know all the answers, but I can raise all the issues which I find, you know. I mean, South Africa, in the olden days, when we used to politicize people in underground structures that we worked in, it was easy to say, apart in South Africa and apartheid, there's got children who never reach the age of five because they die of diseases which are poverty related rather than as a consequence of there being no nourishing food. You know, uh, kwashi or ko and all of those things. And it was because of the stratification of society uh, and as a result of the apartheid policy. But today I find it's the same thing. Our children die before they get to the age of five. And you ask yourself, why in a democracy so many years after we became a democracy? And the answer must be there. And the answer must not only be what is government doing, the answer must be what are we doing as members of civil society to correct the imbalance. Um, what can Colombia learn? I suppose Colombia, in seeing that there are, there are parallels between their own suffering and the suffering of the South Africans, can perhaps take away from what I've been seeing, speaking here, that there was a time when South Africa was subjected to the most horrendous government that, that one can think of. That's why I went to town about how, you know, um, South Africa's apartheid order manifest, manifested itself in the gross violations of human rights that took place during the apartheid era. And I tried to indicate um, in my speech about what was done and what was not done. How we got to a stage where we could, for the first time in about 300 years, there could be a proclamation of an interim constitution which guaranteed rights and freedoms to people who have never, who had never had those kinds of rights before. The fault lines, of course, have been evident, and I think that was the essence of today's address. What have been the fault lines and how have they been dealt with in the last 30 years of our democracy? And that is the question that I think we want to tease ourselves. But just like the land question, I mean the land question suffers from a major flaw and that is uh, a section in the constitution you know, uh, I think it's section 20, yeah, one. Yeah. I mean, that section entrenches the ownership of land to what the position was in 1913. Claims for dispossession, I mean, claims for, you know, um, um, It's easy for politicians to talk about, <laughs> you know, no, uh, what's this in land uh, without, without compensation? Uh, it's, but I don't see the tools where, which can be used by the people who have been landless in the country of the birth. Uh, and I think that is going to be, that's a, a big issue. I don't think the current administration has addressed it, even as it's sought to deal with section 25 of the constitution. Um, so the land question is going to be a big problem. And I don't know what in this silly season of uh, campaigning for the elections that are ahead of us, what um, 
the political parties are saying about uh, about uh, about land, but land is going to be central in the struggles that lie ahead of our society because in my view um, it has not been addressed in a manner that satisfies those who were dispossessed historically of the land that they held. There was a question about justice in Palestine, the genocide, violation of every article of human rights institutions. Um, again, it's a sad reflection on the efficacy of international law. There was this recent case, International Court of Justice, which South Africa spearheaded. But what was very clear there was the position of the United States um, and that and the United States has been clear right from the beginning when the president there, Joe Biden, uh, almost in tears said, I will stand by Israel. Now, you should appreciate that in the United Nations Security Council, uh, the members of the Security Council, you only need one member of the Security Council to, to veto whatever resolution is sought to be taken or a resolution that was taken by the General Assembly and which uh, finds audience in the, in the Security Council. And if you have been following the votes in the United Nations Security Council, the United States has been very consistent, even before the matter gets raised, you know, and they consistently, ins and there's no logic you can say, but you know, this is not even a question of Zionists against, it's a question of men's inhumanity to men. Men, women, elderly men, women and children are being slaughtered, you know. Um, and, and everybody will be saying, this calls at least in the minimum for a ceasefire. The Americans will not commit themselves to that. And I mean, we all know the United States, you know, in terms of military hardware, they, they are the strongest military power in the world. And, uh, but more importantly, in the structures of the United Nations, they thwart every attempt by the progressives. So also is the UK under this fellow who is the prime minister there. And you get a sense that even Germany and the and European countries will rather vote with the United States, uh, but even if the United States votes alone, because it has got this veto power, no resolution will, uh, will be passed uh, that would be helpful to the cause of the Palestinians in the Middle East, especially in this current crisis uh, in the Gaza Strip. So it's, it's, it's geopolitics. Now what does that mean? Does that mean that all of us who are interested in the liberation of the world from gross violations of human rights must give up and say, hey, this is a, 
This is a dead end. There is no reason that we must continue to struggle. Well, I didn't say so when I was addressing ourselves here. And I was saying struggle must continue. Because I'm sure some of you are old enough to know what life was under apartheid. And there was a time when some of us would ask ourselves, hey man, do you think that we'll ever get, you know, we will ever get to a stage when this kind of government, very strong military in Southern Africa, in fact in the African continent, can we really bring an end to this nightmare? But the rest is history. So on the one hand, there is always this despair that we are dealing with a very strong force to reckon with. But on the other hand, we are dealing with a people's determination to be free. And if that people's determination to be free was able to do to get rid of the apartheid order, then that determination would be able to deal with the current problems that would render it possible for us to get a better life than we have got under the current dispensation. See, the problem with a lawyer is that he never stops talking and therefore <laughs> I might find myself you know, speaking forever in the day. But those are the answers, uh, my tentative answers to the questions that I think I've dealt with the first round, maybe the last round. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice. Um, we Colleagues, we seem to be running over time in terms of our program, um, and we're trying our best to stick to the time of our program uh, because of the dignitaries that are attending today who may have to leave early. But if there are any burning <laughs> desires to ask uh, the judge a question, I'm going to just open the floor for one more round, but maybe two uh, or three. One, okay, the judge says not two, one. <laughs> one person with a burning desire to ask the judge a question. We will take that question and then we'll move on to the next item on our program. Thank you, go ahead, ma'am. Okay, um, is it on? Okay. Thank you so much, judge. Uh, my question won't take time. Uh, my name is Khun Zekodisang, I'm from Show Me Your Number. Um, so I wanted to find out, um, looking at the terrain of gender-based violence in South Africa, um, think if the African court had uh, jurisdiction over certain cases that um, our constitutional courts and courts here in South Africa failed to convict, um, do you feel that the African court could play a role um, if uh, our normal courts fail? And also, what would your role be if, um, versus if the courts that we see um, are failing and how would you fit into the puzzle of addressing the scourge of gender-based violence because it is rife and it is definitely spreading into the rest of the world and it should it not be addressed, we cannot say that um, uh, we have held our lawmakers accountable in any way um, by not asking these questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Judge, I'll ask, give you an opportunity to respond to that. Can I just say that we're trying our best in the African court to deal with issues of gender-based violence. For instance, there was, there was a question that came from, I think, Uganda, where um, people were some, I think one of the East Africa, I think it's Uganda, where a female, uh, two females were in a, in a relationship, were sentenced to long periods of imprisonment, about 14 years, I think. And they, 
you know, that served before our courts because of the attitude of even not only the head of state there, uh, but even of the courts that uh, same-sex marriages or same-sex relationships are gained, you know, the order of, you know, uh, religious prescripts and all of that. So it's still, I mean, homosexuality is still regarded in some of, in most of the African countries uh, as, as, as something that is, you know, uh, not sanctioned. And therefore, even question of gender-based violence, there are many of those cases that come before us in the, in the African court. And we try our best to state in violation of what of the African Charter is gender-based violence uh, not to be tolerated. So, but there is a long way ahead of us just judging from the men. I mean, the African Charter is like the South African Constitution. It has got all these rights entrenched and, uh, and, and, and all the, uh, you know, uh, violations come before us for us to determine whether the violations, you know, um, what the facts are and whether there was a violation of uh, uh, of the rights enshrined in the Charter. Uh, uh, one of the, of course, one of the issues that we have had to deal with, especially in this session, is the, the implementation of our judgments. It's all very well for parties to come to our court, and our court uh, is able to give, you know, orders. Um, um, and the judgments are there for the member states or for the countries against whom we have found to implement our judgments. And the issue has been that the African court doesn't have a mechanism for enforcing the implementation of their judgments. And we have been having um, sessions, uh, and I've been joining them uh, virtually since I, I haven't been able to go to Arusha at this session of the court. And there are many cases that came before that court where or there are many issues that caused us to spend a lot of time in making sure or in, in debating what we need to do in order to make sure that the judgments that we give are implemented by the member states' consent. And uh, if we have to, have to invoke the assistance of the African Union, then we are looking at whether those are ways in which we can eventually get, uh, you know, um, implementation of our orders. But it remains a problem. It certainly remains a problem. Um, and uh, in fact, there was an exodus at one stage of countries who had been signatories to the 